You might have seen the video I did about this benchmark here, the SSR Performance Showdown, where I went deep in the details of how these different SSR solutions in JavaScript work. But I couldn't stop thinking about it. I found myself wanting to dig deeper, and I also found myself thinking of a way that I could potentially make it significantly faster. So uh, the night before a big launch, I was supposed to be doing something important, which is preparing for that launch. But as the ADHD brain does, every other heavy task that wasn't necessary suddenly became much more enticing. I thought that my idea for how to make this faster might be dumb. I was wrong. <laughs> well, I guess I was right. <laughs> because I found a way to make it five times faster. And I'm going to tell you all about that right after this word from our sponsor. PostHog, the all-in-one suite of product tools that you should be using. We should probably define what an all-in-one suite of product tools means, though, because I get a lot of questions about when to or not to use PostHog. I'll make it very simple for you. If your application has auth, is in a user has to sign in to use it, you probably want product analytics. There are other solutions for web analytics, like you know, you want to keep track of which pages are being visited or what refers people are using to get to your site. But as soon as you want to see what a user does and what their workflows are, how long they stay around for, if they churn or not, all of that type of stuff, PostHog's analytics are impossible to beat. Obviously, they're not just that. You can use them for web analytics, session replay, feature flags, experiments, and so much more. I'm all in on the analytics, though. Here's the actual analytics for PickThing, the service I just recently released. And we can see a lot of info in here. We can see retention. How long do people stay around? How often do they come back? When do they churn? And this isn't the only thing I'm using it for. We actually use PostHog for everything at UploadThing as well because it is the solution that we choose. By the way, if you're worried about pricing, don't be. It's really cheap and open source. You can host it yourself if you want to. And let's be real, when their homepage looks like this, you know if this is for you or not. Thank you again to PostHog for sponsoring today's video. Check them out today at soydev.link slash PostHog. Anyways, I want to talk about Theo's secret thing the new framework that I made to do server-side rendering up to five times faster in JavaScript. I want to be clear about a few things. This is a demo. This is probably not the right way to do much of anything. And I don't recommend shipping this in production. That said, I made something really fast here. And no, this isn't using Bun. I did just get it working with Bun, which we'll get to in a second. And it is a little bit faster too, but uh, yeah, <laughs> I made something really fast. So first, let's talk about how the benchmark traditionally works. Here's the server code for the Fastify implementation, which was the fastest before Theo's secret thing. Fastify is like Express, but better. But notably, it also uses Fastify HTML, which is a package for serializing HTML and elements in it so that you can more easily, safely embed things in a dynamic HTML template. So we can see that here because we are using the server HTML call with a template string, which means any variable we call like this isn't being embedded as a string value. It's actually being called with a template function. So this is a function that gets an array with all these different parts between the dollar signs effectively. And then after it has a separate set of arguments that are these things you pass it. So it's much easier to like sanitize it and make sure things are safe. But that's not what we're here to talk about. The server HTML binding is fine. It's fast, it's convenient. But in order to do what I'm doing here, I had to throw it away. I am still using Fastify, but the way I'm passing things around made it so that HTML binding doesn't work anymore. You could theoretically build something like it in the future, but my quick version here, I didn't feel like it. Remember, this is a project I spent like maybe two hours total on. You might notice some things that are different here immediately though. If I pull up the other file so we can compare them side to side, this is very different. What are these workers doing? What's going on here? First, we should understand why I would bother introducing workers. See this huge thing here in the server.get? This is the function that creates the complex HTML page. And we can quickly look at that page if I just npm run start. The page looks like this. There's a bunch of these elements that are placed based on an algorithm, but that means it has to render hundreds of divs and apply math to all of them and embed them all as part of the styles. It's a lot of work, but that work is blocking, which is the important detail. This isn't work happening on IO. This isn't waiting for a database or a network request. This is work happening on the main thread because this is work happening directly inside of JavaScript. All of this code running is blocking any other request from resolving. So until all of this work is done, nothing else can happen. Making it async doesn't help either because this work is happening 
in the main thread. Even if it's async, it just lets it get delayed in case something else happens first and just pushes it back to the back of the queue. But you can only have one of these things running at a time. There is a solution for this in JavaScript though. The solution is workers, not Cloudflare workers, JavaScript workers. They are not fun to get working right as I'll show some of the quirks as we do this. But now that I have them working and specifically I created a pool of them, things are great. I do want to show what it looks like if I don't have that pool though. So we're going to quickly do that. I'm going to delete this code and swap it. So the worker is defined here instead. I'll even worker.terminate because now the worker is unique to each request. For a baseline, I'm going to run the original because their numbers are great, but their numbers are on a very different computer than mine. So we're going to pnpm run start and then use WRK, which is a common package for testing HTTP and just hitting it with an insane number of requests. I have it configured to use 12 threads and do requests as aggressively as possible for 15 seconds. And we're getting about 1200 requests per second on my computer running that benchmark. So as I showed here, I'm now instantiating a worker on every request and the spin up time is a real cost. I'm gonna show that by benchmarking this one instead. And I think the results will, they might still surprise you with just how bad they are. Da, 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 da. Yeah almost a 10x decrease. So when I got this working and I was at this state, I was like, you know what? Maybe I am dumb. Maybe this isn't actually something that can be faster. But I did some Googling. I did some, I did some clotting, I'll admit, and decided it would be worth trying to pool it. By pooling, what I mean is I created 12 workers ahead of time. And this number can be different. I didn't experiment with it at all. It was just a quick number because it was the same number of threads I was using elsewhere. A lot to play with. Regardless, I wanted to see if this could actually theoretically be faster. I had a lot of issues with passing values around and whatnot, but once I got all that cleared out, I got it working, I got it running. Let's restart the server and let's run work one last time. This was the original benchmark. This was my first attempt to make it parallel and non-blocking for the generation of the HTML with a worker on every request. This test where we're reusing workers is almost at 5,000 requests per second. My first few benchmarks were over 5,000 requests per second. That's insane. And it's not like it doesn't work. It works. There are theoretical race conditions because everything is listening for the same message listener, but you can solve that by generating a random number here and passing that down. Like there are solutions to those problems. I didn't bother implementing any of them because I just wanted to showcase the raw potential throughput. And that raw potential throughput is kind of mad. People are curious what happens if I bump the number. Let's do it. Somebody asked for 1,000. Let's run a thousand. Connection refused. That's not a good start. We'll do a hundred. And it got slower because I'm now maxing out the number of endpoints I have available and the number of like cores and threads. So we'll leave that on 12 for now. As I was saying before, when I posted this, the immediate thing people were thinking is that I rewrote it in Go or Rust or something. And once I told them I didn't do that, the next response was, oh, you're using Bun. So I decided, you know what? I, I should give Bun a shot for this. And I did. And it required changing a bunch of things because Bun is both JS standards following and also not at all JS standards following. <laughs> so I had to make a lot of changes, specifically in the worker file. There's a bunch of like magic calls, like this post message call that's just a global that exists. And figuring all of that out was annoying. Also, uh, self.onMessage, this is how you have to bind it in the worker. You can't just run this file. So this file has to be accessed via a worker. It's a, a weird thing. If we want to compare that quick to the non-bun one. Worker here is you're importing parent port from the node worker threads package, parent port.onMessage. We do this specific thing. Y'all get the idea. So how much faster is that bun version? because we're all curious. We all know bun is super fast. Let's see, bun server.js. Make sure you run bun, the name of the file, because if you just bun run start, it's gonna use node still. And then we run work one last time. Okay, I'm getting corrections from chat, which is that bun is doing things the exact same way as the browser does. Good, the browser is dumb, but yeah, it was very different from the node version. But so is the performance. We got 6,500 requests per second, which again, to compare to earlier, the parallel version I did before was 4841 with Node, and now it's 6538 with Bun. Supposedly, Fastify is slower than expected in Bun and should be faster, but it's not. It is faster, it's just not a lot faster like you would expect. Like if you look at the Bun 
numbers on their site. Nodes, HTTP rendering of a React app, it's 14,000 requests per second. Deno is quite a bit faster, but Bun is by far the fastest. That's what I expected to see. It was nowhere near as big of a gap, but it is still a notable gap. But the number that matters a lot more is this one. And I'm afraid now that I have the Bun version, I have to update this Excala draw. Now it goes to about there. <laughs> this may need to be turned sideways in order for things to be readable. Quick Excaladraw tip for those who are like me and overuse this program. If you want to make the aspect ratio of something better, put some dots in the corner. Now when you copy as PNG, it'll be bigger. Wow, you must be using bun. Welp. <laughs> this was fun. One last thing. I mentioned earlier that uh, I thought this was dumb. And then when I realized it worked, I was surprised nobody else was doing this. But I hit up Mateo because he's a, he knows his node well. He made Fastify. He's a node contributor. He knows this shit better than almost anyone. So I hit him up asking if I'm being dumb or if this is actually something that is worth exploring. He replied, launching something on September 24th along these lines. Winky face. So, uh, yeah, I think I might have inadvertently stumbled upon the reason that they were making this benchmark in the first place, which is a proud moment for me. It's fun that when I look at a benchmark like this, I can think through why someone would make it and more importantly, like what could make these numbers higher <laughs> and come to the same conclusion that led to them making this in the first place. That was a very validating moment for me to have the same realization that led to them making the benchmark in the first place. But it's also worth noting that this is just a benchmark. This isn't data that actually meaningfully matters. Once you're blocking on things like database requests, the value of these numbers goes down a ton. I have a whole video about why the node in Next.js specifically benchmarks meant very little because the thing that matters isn't the raw throughput of generating HTML. It's all the other things that are causing requests to take more time. And the better you can handle all of those details, the faster your app will be. This is also why, generally speaking, JavaScript is not a bad option for running things on servers because your server doesn't spend a lot of time doing the task of rendering the HTML. It's spending a hell of a lot more time waiting for database, waiting for networks, dealing with all of these things. But that's why I'm proud of my solution. <laughs> Because my solution shows that when you are living in this land of bullshit, to be frank, even JavaScript could be made to go <laughs> hilariously fast. And if a dumb YouTuber like me can 5x a benchmark from some of the best JavaScript developers, you probably can too. Let me know what you guys think. Are you inspired to go play with workers or are you going to just wait to see what Fastify does? Until next time, peace nerds.